We get so emotionally wrapped up in our patients and that the ups and downs um, are really pretty amazing. So um, I'm gonna try and catch us up a little bit here with, our, with my next talk. I'm gonna be, give you a, a tour through mechanical support for patients with a, a Fontan. Um, some of the research that I'm gonna show you is supported by the ISHLT hardware grant um, is the only disclosure. Um, you know, it's interesting, as, as I showed in my first talk, the number of patients with uh, adult congenital heart disease that are making it into adulthood is increasing. And as I mentioned, the, the major cause of mortality is heart failure. If you look at the uh, number of transplants that are being uh, done in younger patients, almost 10% of them have congenital heart disease. And as Dr. De Pasquale sort of reviewed the uh, UNO statuses um, update as of about a year ago, about a year prior to that, the pediatric heart transplant um, uh, uh, statuses were also changed to try and uh, even out the uh, uh, allocation system to favor patients who are sicker. And so mechanical support is certainly the highest on the list, both in pediatrics. And we have some patients who cross over when they become adults who are listed under pediatrics who then are taken care of by the adult team and pediatric team uh, combined. And so what would drive you to really think about using mechanical support? Um, I think it's going to be, obviously, how, how long do you have to wait for an organ is going to be uh, one of the drivers. And you can see here, again, this is old data under the old um, system. But if you're in Region 5, which is uh, Southern California, Nevada, or all of California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, you have some of the shorter waiter time, wait, wait list times. But if you're up in Maine or if you're up in Seattle, you have slightly longer wait list times, which probably drives, again, your LVAD utilization. So um, the lighter colors are lower rates of utilization for mechanical support for all comers versus the darker areas for uh, utilization of mechanical support for patients who um, are in other regions and likely represents the, the length of time that patients have to wait. And so the number of patients being supported with um, mechanical support has increased over the years, um, but the numbers are still incredibly small. So PDMAX is the national registry that looks at the use of mechanical support in pediatric patients. And if you look at this report, um, there are 432 devices in the pediatric populations, of which 21% or 77 were um, uh, congenital heart disease. And of those 77, only 48 were single ventricle patients. Now, if you look at the survival, um, interestingly enough, if you got mechanical support, your survival was slightly better if you were a single ventricle compared to a biventricular patient um, who had mechanical support as a pediatric patient. Now, if you look at the adult Intermax um, registry, which looks at adults who got mechanical support, the number of patients who were congenital was only 126, and um, of that number, only 17 had single ventricle physiology. So these, this remains quite a boutique um, area of using mechanical support. And as you can see here, this is um, there's so few patients in this cohort, only 16 here, five deaths. Um, excuse me, 21 total, but five deaths here. Um, you can see how it tracks the non-congenital patients um, in terms of their survival using mechanical support. So mechanical support, Dr. Levy sort of touched upon, so I took out a few of my slides, but one of the goals or long-term sort of hopes is that we can come up with a mechanical support option that um, avoids transplant and avoids end organ damage, so that something that maybe that you implant at the time of um, Fontan completion, something, as Dr. Levy sort of mentioned, skeletal muscle around the Fontan that causes some pulsatile flow. Um, there's some pneumatic devices that are in the uh, research lab that are maybe sort of help pump through the Fontan or um, flow diversion devices, sort of a, a T-type um, uh, device that goes in at the top where the LPA and RPA come off of the Fontan and then sort of propels the blood forward and takes some of the pressure off of your organs. Most of the support that we're talking about is rescue support. So in patients who um, are at the end of the line in cardiogenic shock or looking like they're approaching that and um, are having uh, the difficult ability to survive using conventional uh, medical therapies. So patients, as you can imagine, given uh, their co complexity, uh, complexity as congenital patients, can be very difficult to consider um, mechanical support. And what we've tried to do is every patient that comes through try to do the intellectual um, exercise of thinking how we would apply mechanical support to those patients um, so that we can get better and get um, uh, to a point where we feel comfortable doing it. So if you have an abnormal situs, meaning that your, um, your heart's on the wrong side or your liver's on the wrong side, that, that can obviously present challenges when you have conventional devices that were developed for non-congenital patients. Um, the chamber sizes may be different, which may cause uh, suction effects or um, inappropriate uh, functioning of the device. And uh, 
patients who are congenital have had multiple palliative surgeries, which can make the um, placement of a mechanical device um, ad additionally uh, complicated and also make the transplant even more complicated as, as a result. So all we have at this point are a series of um, case reports and case series. Um, our, our colleagues up at Stanford do a lot of this in the pediatric realm as well as, well as in the adult congenital realm. Um, as early as 2011, there was uh, reports of using the heart mate in the single ventricle um, uh, population. And then uh, there was a patient who was reported out of, um, I believe, Cincinnati, where uh, it was an 11-year-old who had an HVAD for 148 days when he um, underwent an, a heart transplant. And it was primarily for systolic failure. And a lot of what we had discussed in terms of Fontan failure is more of a right-sided heart failure. So that's one of the, the biggest challenges uh, to try and uh, achieve. So this is another series um, that was uh, uh, published not too long ago um, in 2017, where they described three patients who had hypo hypoplastic left heart syndrome um, who were able to get uh, a, a device placed. They used uh, sewing washers in order to displace the VAD a little bit further out from the, ventricula the, the heart so that it would fit. Um, and all of these three patients went on to transplant successfully. Um, most recently, the, out of Cincinnati, they also reported the use of a HeartMate 3 in a filing Fontan circulation. This was just um, or, or, uh, late last year by um, uh, the, the Morales Group and Angela Lortz. Um, there's been a couple uses of uh, the total artificial heart um, being used to remove the entire circuit and basically cannulate the inferior and superior portions of the Fontan and basically use the total artificial heart to, uh, to take over the circulation. Um, this patient went on to uh, transplant uh, uh, successfully. We've had some, at least uh, in the pediatric realm, some difficulty with the, the total artificial heart and haven't used that as our, our sort of choice um, device. Uh, the Berlin heart is something that we use in very young children, and it has been used once in a uh, patient for right-sided support. This is a 27-year-old male with tricuspid atresia and had a bite Bjork Fontan, which, as you recall from Dr. Lax's um, discussion, is having a rudimentary right ventricle that does provide some forward flow. And the patient was uh, transplanted after 13 months of support using the Berlin heart. Um, now, our group has looked at um, some techniques to try and provide some right-sided support in placing the, the Fontan on the right side. Dr. Lever showed some of these slides using the Jarvik, and then we also did something similar using a Heartware HVAD, um, and we created both an extra cardiac model and an RIPA Fontan model by um, defunctionalizing the tricuspid valve, printing a 3D uh, cannula that had some uh, perforation so that it wouldn't cause suction events. And in both of these cases, we were able to demonstrate that um, we could establish flow and take some pressure off the right side of the heart. Um, you can see here that, uh, that we basically went stepwise and then turned on the VAD and then uh, continued uh, uh, support for the, for the model. Um, in the future, as I mentioned, the hope is to be able to provide right-sided support in a long-term sort of model. Um, there are a few devices out there that are used for biventricular support at this time. Uh, we have the, the Jarvik on the right, and this, the, the one on the left is something called the Longhorn, which is a developmental device that's being um, developed by um, Medtronic um, or Hardware. And uh, they, that, that cannula would sit necessarily in the apex of the left ventricle and provide outflow, can, um, outflow uh, support. And the thought was if you could remove the end arm and place that within the inferior portion of the Fontan, that maybe you could provide one to three liters of support during um, someone's lifetime. And the hope is that as, uh, as we evolve and we have the ability to charge these devices maybe transcutaneously, that that could be a way to solve a lot of the problems that have been discussed today. Um, and the one other thing that I was going to mention is uh, some of the groups are using 3D virtual reconstruction to see how the VADs will um, uh, sit in, in the heart so that we can preoperatively plan. But with that, we'll go on to Dr. Lurie for a uh, case presentation.